Hi everyone, my name is Haley and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about fossils today. So I work for the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy as a summer program educator and then I work as a high school earth and space science teacher in Salem, New Hampshire. So I'm really excited that I get to talk to you guys today a bunch about fossils and then a little bit about sharks and it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to go through this lecture and then give you guys a little bit of time to work on the worksheet if you like that's attached. It has to do with estimating the length of a shark based on, based on its tooth. And then I'll hop back on at 11 o'clock to answer any questions that you guys might have. So to talk about fossils, we need to first talk about paleontology. So paleontology is a larger science that kind of encompasses a lot of things, but it is what fossils fall underneath. And if we look at paleontology, it's an awesome word, and it is just chock full of a bunch of Latin and Greek words. So if we look at paleo, paleo means ancient, ont means study of being, and ology is the study of. If you put it all together, it is the study of ancient beings. So paleontology looks a lot at ancient life and kind of how it has changed throughout time. And why do we want to study this? I get all these questions all the time from my students. Ms. Curry, why should we study about this? Why do we care? And I'm sure a lot of you ask your teachers the same thing. And it's very valid. We kind of want to know why we study something. What's the purpose? So paleontology and fossils has a lot of purposes. The first one being evolution. There are so many differences between organisms and we want to know why they become different. Why do we have such variety of life on earth? Why are different plants different, different trees, different animals? Why are these things different? It has to do because of evolution. And fossils provide this only physical evidence for evolution. So yes, Darwin was able to go out and see the finches and their different beaks and was able to make a lot of assumptions. Fossils are what allow us to have this physical evidence for evolution, to kind of see how things have changed throughout time, how that evolution occurs. Next, we have biostratigraphy. Now, biostratigraphy is something that you probably have not heard a lot about of, but it is something that is very cool. So the Earth formed a little over 4.5 billion years ago. And ever since it formed and cooled, we started to produce rock layers. Okay. So we have different rock types, different rock events. And then once we had organisms, we had our organisms start living and dying. And we're able to look at our geologic time. We're able to go and look through the history of our Earth and rock layers. And fossils really help us set up when these time periods start and when they end mostly due through mass extinctions. So by looking at different extinctions, we can kind of set up where a time period started and where a time period ended. Next, we're gonna go on to paleobiogeography, which is another word that is just chocked full of Greek and Latin. So this is the study of ancient life and where they were. So where organisms have lived, where they have gone over time and why they lived there. Okay. So one of my favorite kind of things that you have probably learned about if you've learned about Pangea is when you look at Pangea, there's normally a map and it has a couple organisms on it that don't quite make sense. Normally there's a tropical fern that's found in Antarctica, it's found in South America, Africa, and you can kind of see that it doesn't make sense. A tropical fern would not live in Antarctica unless Antarctica was somewhere else. It also talks about this large reptile creature that lived in fresh water and was found both in South America and Africa. And why would that organism, how could it have lived in both places? It couldn't have crossed the ocean. There's no way for it to happen. There's ideas about coevolution, but what makes sense is that Africa and South America had to be close together. And at one point they were in the same spot and they would have had the same ecology and they would have had that same kind of pattern. Next one is paleoecology, which is the change of the environment over time. Like we kind of talked about with paleobiogeography, different organisms live in different places. You would not expect to find a penguin in the Sahara Desert, okay? You wouldn't expect to find a shark in Wyoming right now as it is, you know? You wouldn't expect to see organisms that shouldn't belong in a place be there. So all of these things fossils allow us to look at. We can kind of go back and turn back time on history and we're able to see what our earth looked like. And that's so cool. And if you don't think that's so cool, um, hopefully you will by the end of this lecture. And I'm really excited to kind of get into it. So before we get started, I want to do a little review. Um, I don't know where all of you guys stand, so I just kind of want to go back to things. So to start off, our geologic timeline is our timeline 
based on geological events and mass extinctions. And if we look at this picture that I have attached here, this is actually a Cambrian Ordovician boundary site in Newfoundland, Canada. So if you, um, right in there from where I'm standing, I just point with my finger and that's not gonna work. Um, right in here, this is where the Cambrian Ordovician boundary lies. So these two geologic periods, it's where they meet up. And so you can see how the rock layers formed. So over time, our rock layers form and there is the principle of, principle of original horizontality, which states that layers stack up just how you would expect them to, one on top of the other, until something changes them. As we know, the Earth is a very powerful and dynamic place. We have mountains, we have earthquakes, volcanoes. So if something happened here that took those layers that were like this, made them turn like this. We're still able to look at our geologic record. Also, there are fun things called index fossils, which are fossils of organisms that were widely abundant for a short period of time. So these organisms would have been found all over the earth and only have lived for a very short period of time. That way, when we look, <coughs> sorry. That one, when we look at that layer, it's gonna be easier for us to kind of match them up. Okay, so if I know that this certain type of snail was only found in this layer for only a couple hundred thousand years, and I find it here in Arizona, I know that if I go somewhere else and find it, that those have to be the same age, and then it helps you create that timeline. There are three types of rocks, sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic. We're gonna talk a little bit about those on the next slide. And we're going to also talk about erosion and weathering, which is the breakdown of rock by superficial processes. So just to kind of review the rock cycle, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, but if not, it kind of has to do with fossils because we find them over here in sedimentary rocks. And we're going to talk a little bit about why. So to become a sedimentary rock, you have sediments and those lithify. So they compact and they cement together. And that is what gets us the sedimentary rocks. And the way that you get sediments is the weathering and erosion of all the other types of rocks and then also natural debris. Okay, so sometimes soil, like decaying organisms, those will become a part of the sediment layer. And fossils that fall, so an organism that dies and is buried in sediment and gets more and more layers, that's where we're going to see our fossils. Now, all of our rocks can turn into other rocks. So... Even sedimentary rocks can weather and erode to be sediments and they can lithify. All of our rocks can go undergo heat and pressure and become metamorphic rocks. And all rocks can melt. And then when they cool and crystallize out, they become our igneous rocks. So today we're gonna to focus more on sedimentary rocks because that is where we're gonna be finding most of our fossils. Metamorphic rocks and igneous rocks are also super cool. Um, I love metamorphic rocks with all my heart. So but we don't get to talk about them today and that's okay. So talking about discovering fossils. So before I go through this, there's gonna be about three slides that kind of look like steps, but they're not linear steps, they can coincide. So we're gonna start off with kind of what we have. So organisms can be two things. They can be hard bodied or soft bodied. So something like us is hard body, right? We are rigid, we have a skeleton or something like a jellyfish is gonna be a little more soft bodied. And when we look at kind of which one of those we're going to fossilize, you're more likely to fossilize a hard body than a soft body. Because when we get buried, we have more of a structure and we have more tissues and bones that can recrystallize or permineralize, which we'll get into a little bit later. And then we also have another way that we can be distinct. We have K, which are large bodied and few offspring, and R, which are small body and many offspring. So it's just the kind of, when you find something, you want to think about what is that? Is that a K or an R? How's it classified? So the first step into anything becoming a fossil is first it has to die. And there are three main ways that an organism can die. It can die naturally. So of old age or sickness, they naturally, they pass away. Two, they can be scavenged. So they were hunt upon. So maybe it's a bunny that by a hawk, or it's something that is being scavenged, something that's being eaten or hunted. Three would be disaster. So these disasters can come as mudslides, earthquake, volcanic events. One really great example, of this is the Burgess Shale, which formed due to a giant underwater slide of sediments, and it created this Burgess Shale, which if you 
go and you look at it, it is just all these preserved amazing organisms at a point of really high evolution. Um, they're just been kind of like a branch of evolution that was an, sorry, it was an ex evolutionary explosion is how they put it. So there's all these crazy organisms that we don't really see any of. They have these crazy appendages and weird claws and it's this beautifully preserved area called the Burgess Shale. So One second. Okay, oh, yeah, that was weird. Sorry, my computer kind of had a little spaz out for a minute, but I think we're back. Okay, so where to move on? Oh, so nat natural scavenge or disaster. So, and then you have to think about where did this organism die? Did it die in a depositional or an erosional environments? So. Depositional environments means that layers of sediment are being added. It is growing. Where erosional is something like lots of pounding waves or a river where it is all being eroded away. Okay. So when we look at where something dies, if we want it to become a fossil, natural death or disaster death, and then in a depositional environment, those are three ways that we could help to make that thing a fossil. It's very cool. All right, so next is decomposition, scavenging, and transport. So what happened after this organism died? Was it moved? If it was moved, it transported some way. And when we see that, we might see if it was, say, like a bone and it got moved down a river, you would see abrasion or rounding or something that happened to that bone that's not going to make it look like it did exactly when it died. Or was there sedimentary, sedimentary compaction? So also, if we are in a depositional environment and there's lots of sand and sediment going on top of us, there's going to be this compaction, which is also going to change things a little bit. Okay, But sometimes this compaction can be good where you're going to able to see some more of the detail that you might not have, such as some of our dinosaurs that we have seen that we did not originally think had feathers, but due to these imprintations, we now see them. So, oops. And then also just the scavenging too. So remember, if it's being moved by not a necessarily like a natural cause like wind water if it is being scavenged upon if vultures come down and they pick at it and they transport it what is happening is it at the same spot that it died in or was it moved these are all things that you just want to take into account when you find a fossil another is the burial environment so if it's depositional that means that there are more sediments and we're compressing if it's erosional you're not really going to find a lot of fossils there because there's no way for it to really be preserved. Okay, it's being transported, it's eroding, and you're not really having it lay down in layers go on top. You're making it more difficult for that fossil to possibly be, for that organism to possibly turn into a fossil. And then we're going to talk about preservation. So there are different modes of preservation, of preservation, and we're going to talk about that in the upcoming slides. And again, erosion, so the differential erosion of fossils. So sometimes we're going to be able to see that. And then finally, when we are discovering fossils, it's really important to understand that there is a huge imposed bias by the people who are create or who are taking up those fossils. Okay, there are things that vary. Be crazy. The weather, your collection technique, if you're taking good notes or not, who you're with. There's a lot of bias that happens here. So in our collection technique. Are you screen washing? Are you surface collecting? Are you quarrying? How are you getting to these fossils? It is important to note how you're doing it because even though every single way can result in you finding a fossil, there's different biases associated with each one. And what I mean when I say bias is that that a lack in accuracy, okay? So that maybe there's a little bit of a bias you do some things. When you have a bias, it means it's a little tilted to one side. Record keeping is extremely important, okay? If you ever, 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 ever take a high level earth science class, I promise you your professor is going to be on top of you about making sure that you are keeping a record. Your field notebook is pristine. You have the date, you have your location, you have your coordinates, you have your weather, you have what you're doing, what you found, sketches, everything. In order to decrease our bias in the field, Good record keeping is so important. 
So if I go out and I find a fossil, but then something happens to me and I can no longer answer these questions, right? No one can go, hey, Haley, where did you find that? And what angle did you find that? What was the rock type around it? Um, what was the weather that day? What technique did you use? Who else was with you? Did someone else handle the fossils? I, if I can't answer that, then there's so much bias, there's so much question around my work. But if I have good record keeping, then that means that they can go back and they can answer all those questions, okay? And also thorough curation. So when we curate something, that means to collect. And when we talk about this, it's the more something that you have, especially with fossils, the more of a clear picture you get. Because you don't always go out and you don't find you don't find a whole dinosaur. A lot of times, like sometimes you just find bits and pieces. You find a couple bones. Sometimes not all parts of it will fossilize, or because of transport, you only find something. So when you get more and more fossils, you're able to really put together that skeleton and figure out what it looks like, what it did, what movement, what did it eat. And the more you have, the easier that picture is, and the less bias, the less guessing that you're doing. So. If anything, please take away from this lecture that record keeping is so important. Taking good notes, extremely important. So we're gonna move on to our two major types of fossils. So this goes back to our preservation. So our two main types of fossils are body fossils and trace fossils. Body fossils are just kind of what they sound like. They, are, they have that organism's body somehow in it, okay? And trace fossils, if you look really careful in here, you can see the seashell imprint. So it's just a trace, okay? When I went to this field site, I there was not a fossil of a seashell there, but there was an imprint of one, okay? And over here, these stromatolites, those were bodies of stromatolites, and you cannot take those. Um, they highly, <laughs> it is illegal. So um, you go and you're able to see them in the ground, and it's really cool to be able to just see this piece of history of something that is so old that there's no way in our lifetime we'd, we'd no one has seen it. No human has seen one of these. And it's right there sitting. Well, that's not true. There are some stromatolites in um, Australia, I'm pretty sure. But like these ones right here. It's the same with when you see fossils. It's You're looking into the past and that's so cool. I'm pretty sure that there are stromatolites in Australia. Yeah. So then we have unaltered remains. So, sorry, back up. Got distracted. In our body fossils, we have a couple different ways that we can get them. So there's unaltered remains, which is just kind of how it sounds. Your remains that don't really have anything that have happened to them. A big one of these are bog and peat bodies. So you might have heard of a peat body. There are a lot of them in the UK, in northern um, England specifically. So basically, peat is a type of material. It's similar to a bog but it slows down that decomposition. So when bodies are buried, their animals are, that's where they go, that's where their bodies are buried. When they get dug up hundreds of years later, they're still preserved very, very well. Same with permafrost preservation. Because of that cold, you're not really seeing, you're not really seeing a lot of decay. So those are unaltered remains. Next we have replacement. And Replacement is when original biological tissue is replaced by new minerals. Okay, so that original tissue is replaced by brand new minerals. And then we have permineralization, which is pore space in the original tissue is replaced by the new mineral. So that is different. So that is, so replacement is when that tissue is replaced by new minerals. And permineralization is when the pore space in that original tissue is replaced by new minerals. And then we have recrystallization, which is when the original material crystallized during preservation, that original crystal structure is reformed. So crystals are really cool. They have very amazing internal crystallized structures. That is why salt is cubed. Um, that's why I like when you see salt, they're in little cubes. So it is when that crystal structure will, is reformed. And then we also have carbonization which is when the original material is replaced by a thin layer of carbon film. So this is very common in plants. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen like a rock with a fern kind of in it. It looks like someone just kind of drew it with black. And that is what our carbonization is. Super common for our plants. From that same field trip with the seashells, I have sticks from the first trees in North America through a carbonization fossil. 
Unfortunately, they're in my classroom in New Hampshire, so I don't have them now to show you, but trust me, they're super cool. Then we also have trace fossils. So body fossils are kind of things that people tend to get a little bit more excited about outside of the field, um, seeing a bone or seeing that that fossil is there. We also have trace fossils, which are super important to telling us how these organisms kind of live. So we can have external molds, which make impression in sediment, and then the fossil will dissolve away. And then we also have internal molds, which gastropod spills with its sediment. And then we have a bunch of different traces. So these just kind of give allude to what they were doing, where these things were. So such as crawling traces, resting traces, dwelling traces, grazing traces, and feeding traces. So now I want to talk to you guys a little bit about sharks and fossils. Now, I'm sure you guys have learned about with Kristen and Marianne this, these past couple of weeks, what sharks are made up of. So we've learned that they, I know that in today's lecture, so that would be Monday, in today's talk that Kristen talked about that sharks are vertebrates, but they are, do not have bones. So they still have those vertebrates, but it is not made out of bone. It is made out of cartilage. And so cartilage is what our ears are made out of and the tips of our nose. And when we look at our bodies and we see that it's our ears and our tip of our nose, we don't see those in our human remains, right? When I look at a skull, there's just kind of a nasal passage here. There's no nose. Um, you don't see ears on skulls. So the same things happen with sharks, right? So if I take this lovely shark above me, Right, that's, I mean, it's a big shark. This is a great white and it's very large, but when it dies and it falls to the bottom of that seafloor and it starts to decay away, it doesn't have that bone structure to be left to mineralize or permineralize. What it does have is its teeth and teeth are something that we can fossilize and those are what we're able to see and study. So shark teeth are super cool. Um, I'm gonna show you guys. So this is a shark jaw. And this is not a fossil because right here, this is just dried parts of the cartilage. And this was preserved using an artistic technique. But if we turn, so you guys can see the teeth, but if we turn this guy around and you look inside, you can see all those rows, all the rows of teeth. Um, so teeth, shark teeth naturally fall out over their course for a lifetime, right? A lot of people know that. Um, they don't have milk teeth and adult teeth like we do. They have this conveyor belt of rows. So throughout its lifetime, it loses teeth naturally. When it eats, or sometimes they just come loose and they fall out. So we're not only just getting the teeth in the shark when it does die, we get teeth all throughout its lifetime. So just how we talked about index fossils being something that was widespread for a short amount of time, shark teeth are widespread, but they've been here for a long time. Sharks are super old. So, and they're also distributed throughout the world's oceans, right? Sharks aren't just in the Atlantic Ocean, just in the Pacific. They're everywhere. So we have tons of shark teeth on our ocean floors. And a lot of our ocean floors are sedimentary environments. So when a tooth falls out, it falls down to the bottom of the ocean floor. And slowly, layer by layer by layer by layer of sediment passes on top of it. Water eventually seeps through. And the pore space in the teeth is replaced by minerals. And that is in our case of per mineralization, which is super cool. We're able to see shark teeth from hundreds of thousands of years ago. That's awesome. So cool. And shark teeth can tell us about sharks. Um, one thing it can do is it can, we can estimate the size of the shark through its shark teeth. So if I look at a shark's tooth, uh, I have a couple in here. So this is just um, half a shark tooth. But if I measure from the tip to the enamel where that color changes, if I measure that in inches and divide it by, and multiply it by 10, I get an estimated length of the shark, which is really cool because that's how we're able to tell how big things are. That's how we're able to say how big a megalodon was, right? Megalodons were real sharks. In fact, they're related to our great white, okay? But we don't, we don't see them anymore, they're not alive. So how do we know that they're real? They're teeth, right? We see these huge teeth that are like two and a half to three inches big. 
They're giant, and we're able to tell by that how big of the shark it was. And from there, we can start to kind of figure out what it looked like, what the shark ate, how big it was, how wide was its jaw. We can start to do all that stuff, which is so cool. We can also tell through shark teeth about its diet and the type of shark it was. So different shark teeth, just like different human teeth, right? We have our shark teeth, which are more for eating for meat. And then we have our molars in the back, which is more for grinding down. Shark teeth are similar. Not all sharks have the same teeth. In fact, there are over 500 species of shark and they all have unique teeth, which is crazy. And you can tell based on the shape what type of shark you came from. And we're going to learn about that a little bit later. So estimating shark size. So I personally love math and I realize that not everyone does. And math is really important for a lot of reasons. And I'm going to go through the long way on how to convert. So here's the deal, right? We talked about it. If I look at my shark tooth, I take my enamel and I go, okay, my enamel is this many inches. I multiply by 10. That's my acid length. Easy. However, not a lot of people measure in inches, okay? We're a very special case. Most of the world measures in metric, which are centimeters, right? I would use centimeters to measure this. Maybe millimeters, but centimeters. So I need to do a little thing called conversion. So I know from the world and measurement that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. And an example that I'm gonna show you guys, we're gonna go through how to measure this. So I need to convert. Now, a lot of you might just immediately go, oh, well I divided by 2.54 and that is how I get my answer, which is totally true. But if I was your teacher, I would say, why is that true? Can you show me how it works? Where are the units? which trust me, I get a lot of grief from my students for. But throughout the years, I've had teachers and professors since I was in high school who have told me, you need to show your work and you need to show your units. And from there, I it saved me a lot of headaches when I got to calculus two and physics two and fate and transport. Trust me, okay? It saves you a lot. So we're going to go through it. You don't have to write it out for everything, but I just want you to start to kind of get used to it so that someday when you are in a harder math or science, you can go, oh, wow, I remember that girl who talked about fossils and she told me to never forget my unit. So if I want to convert, I have a shark tooth that's 1.56 centimeters and I want to estimate the body. I know I need to get from centimeters to inches and then I need to multiply by 10. Now, to get to centimeters to inches, we could just divide or we could do the workout. So I take 1.56 centimeters and I put it over one. Because anything over one is itself in fraction world, right? Two over one is two. Five over one is five. Triangle over one is triangle. Anything over one is the same thing. I then want to multiply that by this ratio. So I know that one inch is equal to 2.5 centimeters. So when some one is equal to one, two is equal to two, that equals one. These have different numbers, but they are equal. So therefore... If I put them on top of each other, this fraction equals one. And I can multiply anything by one by not changing the value, right? So I see that I put centimeters up here because that is how big the shark tooth was. And I want my centimeters to cancel out. So if one thing's on top of another, right, it equals one and anything by one doesn't change. So we can kind of cross them out and move on. So I put my 2.54 centimeters on the bottom and one inch on the top. So I get 1.56 centimeters times inches over 2.54 centimeters. Okay, so those cancel out and I'm left with 1.56 over 2.54. My unit is now inches. I do that math out. I get 0.61417 inches. And then I'm going to round this to three significant digits because I have one, two, three significant digits there. They're really important. We're not gonna get into it now just because that's not the point of this lecture. Just know that sig figs are really important. And we're gonna be all using three here. So I would round, I go one, two, three. I see that my four is my third sig fig. I go to the next number, I see it's a one, I let it be. If it was a five or up, then I would, bump this up to 6.15, but for now, it stays with 6.14.
So now I'm in inches. Now I only have to do is multiply by this factor of 10. And again, I want to keep my straights. I want to keep my unit straight. So for every one inch is equal to 10 feet. So times 10 feet over inches. And that's going to give us a shark that is about 6.14 feet long, which is very cool. So that is a lot of math. The gist of it is that you basically just need to divide by 2.54. But like I said, it's really, really important that you kind of know the breakdown of the math. And even though science and math aren't the same, math is the language of science. And it's really important to respect it and to go through everything that you need to, because by doing the workout, it makes it a lot easier to see where mistakes happen. And when you do get to those higher levels and you can't remember the formula, when you write it out like this and you make sure your units cancel, can find the answer. So I would be remiss if I didn't go over it. I think it's really, really important. And I'm sorry if it took a little bit too long, but showing your work is so important. Just like how good record keeping is when finding fossils, showing all your work and showing your units is how you record keep when you're doing equations. And it's really, really important. Okay. So if you want, you guys can stop here and you can go do your worksheet or you can keep watching and do it at the end, whatever you want to do. So we're going to move on to tooth shape. So like I said, there's over 500 species of shark and they all have unique teeth. So all these guys, right? Everything in here, I have unique teeth. So I kind of want to go through and try this with you guys. So let me see, for starters, if I can do this. I am also new to the new... Um, screencastify world okay awesome so now you guys can see me and i can not see you but i will soon so get this away so some of you if maybe you have visited the conservancy um and been in our multi-purpose learning room you might recognize this which is shark's teeth and what they eat so i have a bunch of different shark teeth and we're gonna kind of go through and match them based on what we see so the sharks that we have playing in the game are shortfin mega, basking, sand tiger, white shark, blue shark, thresher shark, dusky shark, and our spiny dogfish shark. So that's the okay. oh, teeth. So some of them have really weird shapes. So if we look at this one, right, that's not your typical shark tooth. And this belongs to our basking shark. So our basking sharks, they can get anywhere between 20 and 26 feet, and they eat plankton. So even though they have these larger teeth and that they're these huge animals, they only eat plankton. Next, I'm going to talk about two. Let's see if this will stay. <laughs> two teeth that are rather similar. So if we look at these two teeth, we can see that they are very similar, okay? But if you look on this one, sorry, my left and right are backwards on this camera and that's throwing me off. You can kind of see where these little spikes broke off right here. If I look at a real version of this tooth, you can see a little bit better. Do you guys see that little spike? Yeah. So there should be another one on the other side, but they break off pretty easily because how small they are. So these two sharks eat similarly, but not the exact same. So like I said, every shark has a different tooth. So the one with the little spikes on it, or spears, that belongs to our sand tiger shark. And our sand tiger shark is anywhere between 10 to 6 to 10 feet. And they eat bony fish, crustaceans, such as crab, shrimp, lobsters. And then they also eat squid, skates, and other sharks. And our other one belongs to our mako. So our short fin mako shark gets anywhere between 10 to 13 feet. It eats a lot of cephalopods, which are squid, octopus, cuttlefish. They eat a lot of bony fish and other sharks, porpoises, sea turtles, and birds. So another pair of similar teeth are these guys. 
Okay, right, so they again are similar shapes. They have that more of a triangle, a little bit of a curve, and they have the serration on the sides. So the difference there is that one of them is a little bit bigger than the other. So if we look at who these sharks belong to, this smaller one belongs to our blue shark. And our blue shark is anywhere between six to 10 feet, and this large one belongs to our dusky shark, whose length is anywhere between 10 and 14 feet. Our dusky shark eats bony fish, other sharks, skates, and rays, and our blue shark eat cephalopods, which are our squids, octopus, cuttlefish. They eat crustaceans, crabs, shrimp and lobster, bony fish, and other sharks. Now we also have our thresher shark. Now this shark, this tooth, belongs to our thresher. And our thresher shark is anywhere between 9 to 20 feet, so it has a little bit more of a range on size. And it is, it eats pelagic schooling fish, cephalopods, and spot it. That's his tooth. It doesn't have a magnet, so we'll just put him right down there. Now, this next tooth I'm going to show you um, is one of my favorite teeth. I think it's so fun. So if you look at that, this belongs to our spiny dogfish. And our spiny dogfish is very little. He only grows to be two to four feet. He eats a lot of fish and cephalopods. And what is really cool about our dogfish is they kind of get their name because they do hunt in packs. They all kind of live together, and then they do they eat kind of in this weird pack situation. But spiny dogfish are super abundant off the waters of Cape Cod. They're actually one of our most sustainable fisheries because of the high numbers of them. They're one of the most abundant fish in the sea. And we're able to fish them at a very sustainable rate, which is awesome for our New England fisheries and for the Cape's fisheries. So most of them get shipped off to the UK to become fish and chips. But they're really amazing little creatures. And you can probably, if you ever go fishing off Cape Cod, you honestly probably catch them. They're everywhere and you can just release them. But if you ever get a chance, if you're ever at the fish pier um, and ask a fisherman what to look inside of its mouth, you'll see these little teeth and these little rows. And if you go this way, it's kind of smooth. And if you go this way, it's rough because your fingers will touch, but they're not sharp. And our final tooth is the great white's tooth. So like I kind of talked about how we can tell about the megalodon from its teeth, and we know that the great white and the megalodon are related. The great white's tooth looks a lot like the juvenile megalodon's tooth because the juvenile megalodon was about the same size as an adult great white. So that is how we kind of can see there's a relation there. Okay. So great whites, they get to between 16 and 18 feet, and their diet is bony fish, marine mammals, seals, and whales. So as you guys can see here, these are just some of the sharks that we see here off the coast of our beautiful New England waters. And we have so much variation between what they eat. And then, like I said, all of their teeth are going to be different. Really crazy. So I hope you guys learned a little bit about fossils today. Um, and I didn't bore you too much with the math. But like I said, it's important. So please feel free to do those worksheets. Maybe write down any questions that you guys have now. And I'll be happy to jump on at 11 to answer any questions you may have. I really want to thank the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy for allowing me to do this and giving me so much of the knowledge and resources. And then also the University of New Hampshire's Earth Science Department. Um, I was able to take amazing classes. That is what taught me all about these rocks. And I think it's really amazing that just because you go into one field of geology, which is what I went into to study, um, I'm able to do that. But I'm also able to follow this extra passion of working um, with people to teach them about these beautiful creatures. So please stick around till 11. I'll be on and I'm excited to chat with you. Thank you.